40 years ago this fall, our founders came together to make sure that people in our part of North Carolina would never go hungry. Today, that commitment is stronger than ever. Our leaders, our staff, our volunteers, we share the same vision, to help people when they need it and work to ensure that they don't. This is Path to Ending Hunger, the podcast for the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina. Today, we'll look at how the Friends of the Food Bank help us serve nearly 600,000 people in 34 counties. Well, hi everyone, I'm Tisha Powell, and this is Path to Ending Hunger. And since this is our very first episode, I thought that we would start by telling what we are hoping to accomplish here at the Food Bank. For the last 40 years, the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina has been nourishing communities for a large portion of our state while also building solutions to what will hopefully one day end hunger. And I think that's what we all want to see. The Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina serves 34 counties, and that's a third of the ninth largest state in the country. And this podcast is a look back at how the food bank has grown, how everything has begun, and looking at ways to address hunger in ways that maybe you haven't thought of. Before we can figure out where we are headed, it's nice to look back at where we have been. And that's why we've invited our first director, Barbara Oates, over. And then we will talk to the current director, Peter Werbicki. And I'm so happy to have both of you here with me today. We'll start off with you, Barbara. Since you've started, this all seems like it's, we've, we've been through so much. And I guess my first question is, with what was the situation in 1980 that made you say, we've got to do something to address hunger in North Carolina? So back before 1980, we had President Jimmy Carter in office, and we really did have sort of an awareness, I think, um, in our country that there were people out there that had needs. Um, but there weren't really that many people actually doing something about it. In North Carolina, we have 100 counties, and we had 100 community action agencies that got federal funding funneled into North Carolina to feed our needy. Well, Reagan came in, Don, Ronald Reagan came into office, and people started saying, maybe it's not the government's responsibility to feed all these people. And um, there was a newscaster who had a morning show Sunday morning. Charles Corralt was his name. He was very, very popular. And his Sunday morning show um, featured the director of a Catholic Charities out in Phoenix, Arizona, who was feeding people with produce that was actually would have gone into the landfill. He interviewed them and he showed the facility um, and it aired around the United States. People were so enamored with the fact that there was food that was being wasted in huge quantities and that there was a solution that was happening in Phoenix of actually recycling food that would otherwise have been thrown away. And it just, it was one of the very first viral moments in our social media because it was before cell phones, really. And um, everybody got the buzz, you know, all over the United States. And so people were going, well, how do we do this? How do we do this? You know, and everybody wanted to do it. Well, in North Carolina, like I said, um, we were doing it through community action agencies, and the Episcopal Diocese had started a, um, a, a, an entity within their organization that was focusing on um, social services. There was a Reverend Lex Matthews who was in charge of that, that section, and he actually helped start um, different social ministries within the Episcopal churches in North Carolina. The, one of the first ones was soup kitchens, which happened to be my mother started the soup kitchen in Raleigh, downtown Raleigh, at Church of the Good Shepherd. And she ended up realizing that there were a lot of hungry people out there that had to be fed, and they had a budget, you know, no budget really. And so she heard through Lex's um, connections that there were food banks that were, were able to help supplement soup kitchens. So th mother was actually called to a meeting in Raleigh of, of the social service people that were present. And um, she said, Barbara, I'm, I'm too busy doing the soup kitchen. You need to go to this meeting. A mother of a four-year-old and a two-year-old. 
I had nothing else to do. So um, I went to this meeting and we found out that really and truly there was a huge interest to do this, but everybody had their jobs and I was the only one who did not have one. So I said, well, I can look into what's going on. And we started um, really going ahead and setting up a legal entity so that the food bank, it was a really complicated incorporated name. It's called Food Bank Inc. <laughs> and so we ended up having this um, umbrella, but we had no agencies, we had no food donors, we had um, no system of being able to transport, you know, quantities of food. So it turned out that we got a warehouse that was NP warehouse that was as big as the space where the agencies go and shop right now, not this humongous facility. And it was me, a card table, and a telephone, and an empty warehouse. And it worked. But I don't think it was me. You know, I think that really and truly, the timing and everything, I, Barbara likes to say it was a God thing. Mm -hmm. And how many people, how hard was it to get people to come in and help out. How did your numbers grow? Because when you look around now, you see all of these volunteers and all of these people. Walk me through how you were able to lure people in and see this vision and get word of mouth to bring more people in. So you being in the media business, we had this machine that was about this big and it was sort of portable, but not really. Um, and we did a video and we carried it to churches, we carried it to um, synodical events, we carried it to the warehouses that people, for the food industry, um, and then we also, uh, North Carolina was very much, a, and it still is, a very legal entity in terms of the Department of Agriculture had all kinds of questions. We could not open our doors until we could prove to them that volunteers were smart enough to actually sort through food and make sure they didn't get the public sick. We had to um, actually make sure that we were um, not selling the food that was in competition, that would be in competition with the food industry people themselves. And so we had a handling fee charge, which was really something that was developed in Phoenix, and so we just copied that. We had to do an inventory, inventory control because the Department of Agriculture said if we got a donation that actually had some kind of food poison in it, we had to be able to recall it. Mm -hmm. Nobody was doing food inventory because every state regulates differently. And North Carolina was just tough as nails. So all this stuff had to happen at one time, and I was getting paid to keep my children in child care, $5 an hour for um, 20 hours a week, and had to get it all done. There really weren't any agencies that were feeding people. There were a few food pantries in the big cities, but rural North Carolina had nothing going on. And so it was really one of those things of having to go out and tell these agencies, you know, that they needed to go out and help people develop um, the organizations and stuff. We were feeding the Indian population down in Lumberton, they had a pretty big social services group that was distributing food and they would drive up to Raleigh and get foods, you know, from us. Well, you have gone on to make a difference in so many people's lives and we definitely thank you for that. Um, when we come back, we will talk to Peter about what the food bank is facing right now, which is probably one of the biggest challenges ever. Stay with us. Hey there, this is Vivian Howard from the PBS show A Chef's Life and Somewhere South. Growing up in Deep Run, North Carolina gave me an appreciation for local agriculture and traditional Southern food. But when I returned to Kinston to open a restaurant, it was clear to me many were struggling to find enough to eat on a regular basis, which is why I support the food bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina. They're working every day to nourish people and build solutions to end hunger. And they place a priority on distributing healthy and fresh food, including produce from right here in Eastern North Carolina. To find out how you can help, please visit our website, foodbankcenc.org.
Welcome back, everyone. We are in the teaching kitchen at the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina in the middle of their working warehouse, so there's a little bit of noise that you may hear. And Peter, this year the Food Bank has reached a big milestone. As an organization, you have distributed one billion pounds of food into 34 counties that you serve over the last 40 years, and that's a huge feat. To begin with, um, based off the uh, terrific foundation that, that you heard from Barbara and that she left us, um, I joined the organisation in 1997 and um, since, since then um, there are a couple of other executive directors, Lois Volker and Greg per Kirkpatrick, um, who had taken the organisation on and I think when I joined um, the food bank was distributing about six million pounds at that time and um, I, I think for me um, around that time there were a couple of interesting developments. Um, one interestingly enough was um, a federal commodities program um, that had been formally administered with the Department of Health and Human Services, what we call the TFAP program, the Emergency Feeding Assistance Program. Just as I joined, that program was sort of centralised with food banks. Um, and, you know, today, that program, over the course of 20 years, we now provide about 26 million meals through that program. Um, so, so the Federal Commodities Program has certainly helped us in our mission. I would also say a, a sort of defining moment um, for, for us as an organisation was in 1999 with Hurricane Floyd. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, um, just before that we had launched two branches, um, two additional branches that we'd had. We'd had one in Sand Hills right from the very get-go. Um, and whilst we'd done and increased our distribution, um, we felt that we had not maybe distributed it as well as we could have done throughout our 34 county service area. So the, the idea behind the branches, and Durham and Greenville in particular, was to kind of um, fair share the product out um, uh, more proportionally into our 34 counties. So we just launched Durham and Greenville um, and then come along Floyd. Uh, and I know certainly in Greenville, um, the first five months of the Greenville branch, it acted as a disaster relief warehouse site. Um, but what that did, um, because our aim was to grow in the number of partner agencies in our 34 county service areas so that we could expand upon our food and in turn expand upon it into the local community. Because of Floyd, um, we kind of had this um, huge spike in increase of new partners. Um, the food bank that year went from um, around eight, eight to nine million pounds to 18 million pounds. It was a huge leap for the organization and having the branches, and, uh, particularly Greenville, um, just, just the timing, you, you sort of sometimes look for the good that come out of, comes out of the bad and certainly our timing was perfect and um, you know we never looked back uh, after that, we, never, we didn't see our distribution drop off the year following, we, we, we maintained that rate. Um, then we sort of developed um, what was called the Breaking Bread campaign. Um, a, a big component of that was um, further developing our infrastructure at the branches um, and particularly around um, sort of strategy around product. Um, we definitely wanted to grow um, an increased need that we were seeing but also provide um, highly nutritional product and produce was certainly a big piece of that. Um, so infrastructure at the branches um, was a big part of the Breaking Bread campaign. We began also um, through that campaign um, focusing specifically on kids programs, child centric programs and kids cafe programs and after school programs. Um, we began to launch in 34, 34 of our counties. Um, since that time, um, you know, we've added the Newburn branch. Um, Greenville has had two homes. Um, the Durham branch has had three homes. And um, 
about three years ago now, um, three and a half years ago now, um, we had the um, so All May Eat campaign, um, which was really um, for us to move the organisation um, to a larger footprint, um, the headquarters, if you like, here in Raleigh, uh, where we're sitting today. Um, we, you know, I think um, sort of years ago we used to measure the need of food um, through poverty statistics and since that time um, you know food insecurity numbers have come along and um, sophisticated sort of models of measuring the number of meals that needed to be provided and um, back three and a half years ago um, you know that measurement was about 110 million meals annually and we recognized the current headquarter site that we had was not going to be able to manage um, the increased need there. So um, thanks to um, all along, really, um, again, we could not have done the work that we've done without the incredible support that we received from the community. Um, and so many people in the community need this program. And when we come back, we'll talk about who needs food, who needs this program. Stay with us. The Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina has provided food for our friends and neighbors facing hunger in 34 counties for 40 years. Simply put, the Food Bank works every day to provide food to people in need while building solutions to end hunger in our communities. Through a network of more than 900 partner agencies such as soup kitchens, food pantries, and shelters, they nourish families, children, and seniors living with food insecurity. Through education and programs, the Food Bank empowers communities to overcome hunger, creating an environment where all North Carolinians thrive. Find out how you can help by visiting foodbankcenc.org. That's foodbankcenc.org. Well, welcome back to Path to Ending Hunger. And Barbara and Peter, let's talk about who's hungry? Where is this food going in our community? Anyone? Yeah, I'm not sure that it's exactly changed over the years. I mean, certainly in terms of the numbers have changed. I know, again, going back to 97 when I joined, uh, there were just under um, 300,000 people who we were measuring were uh, at the poverty level. Um, and again, we've moved to food insecurity now. During the sort of recession, the Great Recession that we had, um, we met sort of uh, a new height, which was about 650,000 individuals in our 34 county service area. And then we were beginning to see um, improvements. You know, we were sort of, um, I think, you know, believing that a lot of our um, work that we um, had initiated was beginning to make a change. And um, the number uh, had dropped to about 550,000 individuals. Unfortunately, the pandemic has um, switched that situation around again. And um, we're looking now, um, we've seen about a 200,000 um, people increase, uh, those that are now food insecure. Uh, that's about 38% increase for us. And, and so what the pandemic has shown really is how many people, especially um, working families, are just working paycheck to paycheck. And that when they have some calamity um, occurrence in their life, um, they then, you know, do not have the financial resources um, to provide for their family, for, to, to pay for the heating bills, to pay for the utilities, to pay for the rent. Um, and so food comes last, you know, food comes last. And um, again, you know, the pandemic, I think, if, if nothing else, has exposed um, how many individuals there are in the community that, you know, don't have savings or resources, but simply are living paycheck to paycheck. And you know, talking about back in 1980, it was very interesting to me as a 30-year-old mother of two, how many in the Raleigh area was so heavily 
um, invested in the legislature and all the government agencies. There are a lot of single mamas who are secretaries and, and you know working staff who were just what Peter was talking about. If they had a child that got sick and they had exorbitant medical bills, they they were in dire straits, you know, at that point in time. And yet, you know, you would see these people on the street and you would go, oh, they're fine. But they weren't fine. They were that, that walking that line, you know, it just it, nothing that they did wrong, but just circumstances that come up, whether it's a pandemic or if it's an illness or whatever. And um, they have to choose what they're going to pay for, whether it's their medicine or food or rent or food. And you were saying the food comes last. And what's been so marvelous is that we've had all these volunteers who've been willing to come in and at a, at a minute's notice be able to jump in and help in these situations. I mean, it's phenomenal the, to see the volunteer forces that come in here and just jump in or I don't know that you know about this program, but they actually have a, um, a program where they will have a farmer come in with his surplus of sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm and they'll put it in the parking lot out at RTP, at one of the big corporations out there, and people will take their lunch break, they'll take comp time, whatever, and they'll go get little plastic bags and they'll stuff them full of potatoes, and by the end of the day, the whole tractor trailer load of, of, of potatoes has been gathered up and it comes back to the food bank and gets distributed. And that's just amazing to see how some people will as you mentioned, Barbara, you may not know their circumstances and, and they may look fine on, on the outside, but these are people who are actually working, who are just struggling to, to make ends meet. Yeah, certainly the majority of those that we're serving are, are, are sort of working families. Um, and again, within that, you know, there are, there are children. Um, you know, we, we're currently serving uh, over 300,000 of um, you know children in our service area, unfortunately as well you know a, a sort of growing demographic is seniors. Um, you know that has sort of hovered around the, the sort of nine to ten percent range um, in terms of those living with food insecurity. But we know going forward that that number, that demographic, is is, is going to increase. And um, you know again many many seniors. Um, if they are, you know, they're, they're working longer or if they retire, they don't have, you know, the financial wherewithal, um, you know, to, to support them. That's one of the reasons just recently we um, began a uh, senior um, food program outreach um, that we're doing in about uh, 20 of our counties right now, um, particularly aimed, you know, to, to try and fill that gap with, with seniors. Yeah, I think um, this position that we are in now with COVID-19 and the pandemic has really put us as a community in a place where we really have to support and help each other. And this is a prime example of how that all works, coming together as a community with partnering agencies. And one thing that I want you to touch on before we go with this segment is we didn't get a chance to mention like the the equipment that you have now, the freezer section, the huge amount of storage that you have and how that truly helps your ability to provide for the community. Yeah, for sure, as we've grown our food um, recovery and distribution, again, you know, we've been concentrating on providing more nutritional uh, quality of product. Uh, invariably that is perishable it's meats dairy products and produce and that requires a lot of infrastructure with freezers and coolers and the trucking etc to deliver it to the partner agencies the partner agencies you know um, we help them with their capacity for freezers and coolers also um, the other thing that I, you know wanted to mention as well is that um, whilst you know again um, we, uh, our traditional model is, um, you know, uh, recovery of food and, and distribution uh, with this facility and where we're sitting today in the, in, in the teaching kitchen is that the food bank and many, you know, Feed in America has evolved to, um, uh, you know, many of us have been around for 30, 40 years 
to evolve to build in solutions. Um, and certainly, again, with the pandemic, you know, that it's exposed some frailties in the food system. And I do believe that kind of moving forward, there'll be even greater strategy um, for innovation and implementation of ideas about building solutions. So folks, um, you know, are, are, are more um, sustained, um, you know, and have sort of deeper resources and, and won't be, you know, requiring to go visit those partner agencies. That's our hope anyway. All right, thank you, Peter and Barbara, for being with us today. And we are going to focus on something next time that unfortunately people in North Carolina have to deal with, and that is disasters, everything from COVID now to hurricanes. And we'll talk about how to get through them and how the food bank helps. So until then, I'm Tisha Powell. Thanks for listening. This has been Path to Ending Hunger the podcast for the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina. Thank you for listening and for caring. At the Food Bank, our doors are always open. Perhaps one day they won't have to be. Until next time. To find out how you can help, please visit our website, foodbankcenc.org.